In a previous episode, I mentioned how I was reading something and misread cancel culture as cancer culture. Just the other day, I likewise read an article about someone who was banned from a platform for violating community standards, but I misread it as violating communist standards. It's funny how serendipity works. Economist Zoltan Pozar made the news by claiming that we might be going into Bretton Woods 3. To explain that to the casual viewer, it might be good to explain what Bretton Woods 1 was. As World War II was winding down in 1944, most of the nations of the world convened at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire at a hotel, whereby they hashed out the future world economic system. In this system, everyone agreed to trade internationally using U.S. dollars as the world's reserve currency. America basically bribed the world into peace. Historically, empires fought over naval trade lanes and used massive navies to secure their colonies around the world. America basically said that they would run the trade lanes with their own massive navy and that everyone else could use it for free. No more costly wars. America would guarantee that the shipping lanes would be safe and open, and the United States even pledged to lose market share internationally to give everyone else an economic advantage. Instead of spending money on your own military, you could use that money for domestic social programs, and all you had to do was side with us against the Soviets. We basically bribed the world to be on our side, and it worked. This system operated stably, with a few notable bumps, until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. At that point, the planet changed from a multipolar world to a place where America became the sole superpower. They called this period from 1991 to the present, Bretton Woods II. Recently, Zoltar Pozar sent shockwaves through the economics world when he said that with the rise of China and the world distrusting the United States as it began using sanctions as an economic weapon, a new era has begun, what he's been calling Bretton Woods III. This was instigated by the United States taking the unprecedented step of shutting off people's money. They did this in Afghanistan. Then they recently did it to Russia, saying that Russia couldn't use the international SWIFT system to settle transactions, nor would America redeem U.S. treasuries that Russia held in its central bank, thus effectively turning off its money. It was akin to what happened in Canada when the truckers went on strike and people sent in donations and GoFundMe refused to process the transactions, and the government of Canada shut off people's bank accounts who went to the protests. This remote shutting off of people's money has hit the international stage, and now people are increasingly not trusting the United States. People are looking to jump off the American financial grid. So what we're watching is not a single world economic system, but a fragmentation where countries are looking to create their own grids and trade among neighboring nations to create their own regional trading blocks. One critic of Zoltan Pozar wrote that Bretton Woods III won't work. Nice narrative, but it's just mercantilism. Sanctions on Russia are seen as accelerating a dramatic shift towards a new global commodity-focused Bretton Woods III architecture. However, this is actually a very old economic argument. Mercantilism. To pause here for a second, it might bear pointing out that before the age of capitalism, the world was in the age of mercantilism. In capitalism, we made things. The Industrial Revolution created factories, and those factories created massive surpluses. Before that time period, however, we didn't really make too much. We merely sailed to foreign lands, bought goods there, and then shipped them back to Europe to sell at a higher price. To do this required massive deep-sea navies. Corporations grew out of this time period, like the Dutch East India Company or the British East India Company. Portugal fought with England over colonies, Spain fought with France, France fought with Germany, and so forth. This is all foreign to us who grew up under the Bretton Woods system where no one was fighting and there was just one world system. Economist Jim Rickards talks about the age of mercantilism here. International economic conduct involves granting advantages to internal industries and imposing tariffs on foreign goods. Trading is done with friendly partners to the exclusion of rivals. Subsidies and discrimination are legitimate tools to achieve economic goals. In its most succinct form, the mercantilist takes the view that trade is war. Success in mercantilism was measured by the accumulation of gold. Although mercantilism has its roots in the Hundred Years' War of the 14th and 15th centuries, it reached new heights with the formation of the East India Company in England in 1600 and the Dutch East India Company in the Netherlands in 1602. While these companies operated as private stock companies, they were given wide-ranging monopolies, supported by the power to raise armies, negotiate treaties, coin money, establish colonies, and act in the place of the government in dealings with Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Scholars have focused on the private features of these firms, such as stock ownership, dividends, and boards of directors. However, given their quasi-sovereign powers, they are more properly understood as extensions of the sovereign with private owners and managers. This arrangement bears comparison to regional Federal Reserve Banks in the United States, which are privately owned, but act as a financial arm of the government. It was only in the late 18th century, with the Industrial Revolution and the publication of The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, that a more modern form of laissez-faire capitalism with private ownership and banking arose. Yet through the 20th century, despite the success of private enterprise, state-controlled businesses still prevailed in societies dominated by communists, fascists, oligarchs, and many other anti-democratic forces. What we today take for granted as the dominant financial paradigm of private capitalist free enterprise and entrepreneurship is, in fact, exceptional in most times and most places. 
Private enterprise may have the greatest claim to efficiency in wealth creation, but these are not universally held values. Capitalism's claim to dominance in the future of global trade, finance, and technology would seem to have no stronger historical basis than the claims of monarchy, imperialism, communism, and other systems in their day. Companies that appear private but have nearly unlimited state resources behind them, such as China Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, known as Sinopec, are able to bid on natural resources, buy competitors, and invest in equipment without regard to short-run financial impacts. They are able to gain market share by selling below cost. They do not have to worry about losing access to capital markets in times of economic distress. Such entities need not fear investigation by their own government if they bribe dictators and their troops to protect their interests. This neo-mercantilism is the power of the state dressed up as a modern corporation. Old wine in new bottles. No doubt the corporation grew up in the age of mercantilism as a tool of state power. Now here's what we're dealing with now. A bifurcation. Whereas in a place like China, as Rickards points out, corporations are sock puppets of the government, while in the United States, the government is a sock puppet of the corporations. See Eric Lee talk about it here. Now in China, uh, there are a lot of problems. Uh, but at the moment, the Chinese, the party state, has proven an extraordinary ability to change. I mean, I make the joke how in America, you can change political parties, but you can't change the policies. In China, you cannot change the party, but you can change policies. Uh, so in the 65 or 66 mm -hmm. years, China is being run by one single party, yet the, the political changes that have taken place in China in this past 66 years uh, have been wider and broader and greater than probably any other major country in modern memory. So in that time, China ceased to be communist. Is that what you're saying? Well, China is a market economy, and it's a vibrant market economy, but it is not a capitalist country. Here's why. There's no way a group of billionaires could control the Politburo as billionaires control American policymaking. So in China, you have a vibrant market economy, but capital does not rise above political authority. Capital is not, does not have enshrined rights. In America, capital the interest of capital and capital itself has risen above the, na the American nation. The political authority cannot check the power of capital. And that's why America is a capitalist country, but China is not. Like I said, we're seeing the emergence of two different models shaping up. One, a system where the corporation is a tool of state power, and the other, where the state is a tool of corporate power. Whichever model prevails, make no mistake, we're gonna be heading into some dicey times. The original age of mercantilism was a place of constant warfare. The 70-year period of Bretton Woods and relative peace was the historical anomaly. We may just be heading back to the old historical norm. For the unipolar American system to have worked would have required the world to trust us. Like how Thomas Madden described the old America in his book, Empires of Trust. He wrote, Even at its peak, Rome had no more than 200,000 men under arms across its empire. That was far too few to hold down an empire stretching from Scotland to the Persian Gulf. The United States has approximately 1.5 million troops, which is likewise far too small to dominate a world of 6.5 billion people should the world not wish it. Yet both powers had and have sufficient military power to respond to numerous local threats or even several major threats to security among their allies. That is all that is needed, that and trust. For without trust, everything else falls apart. Without trust, other powers will arm themselves, leading inevitably to insecurity, war, and collapse. Our old elite understood this. They had to behave ethically and have a good reputation to keep the system going. Our new elite, by contrast, acted like an old communist security state and started turning off people's money and using sanctions as a tool of economic policy. Once that happened, we lost the world's trust. And now we're in the process of losing what was once called the American Empire. Just a brief info alert, I'm going to be starting a new show called Actionable Ethics. Why? Only two times in history did a civilization reverse its decline and reinvigorate its culture. The method of the recovery? Ethics. It happened in the Byzantine Empire, and once again, when Confucius saw his country falling apart and set out to reverse it by touching off a moral revolution. I'm no Confucius, but I will be starting a show called Actionable Ethics. Look for it soon on The New American.